Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I'm going to be going through the 10 most important albums in music history. Well at any rate the 10 most important in my opinion. Of course you may have a different opinion and you are welcome to it but you've come here to see my opinion and hear my opinion and that is what I'm going to give you. This is my opinion of the 10 most important albums in music history and I'm going to try and rank them from 10 to 1. Um, the album is a specific piece of art, an art form that is really associated with the age of rock music. Okay, The album as an idea doesn't really emerge to the 1950s. We have a music industry before that, but the music industry is, is releasing 78 records and then in the 1930s the radio becomes very important and then we start to see the beginning of like um, singles, um, 10 inch records, e EPs and the album doesn't really gain um, a foothold to the 1950s and I'm going to try and go through that on this video as well um, and I think there's a magic to the vinyl LP Two pieces of music divided in the middle, you know, so you have to listen to 20 minutes, then turn it over and then listen to another 20 minutes. That 20 minutes chunk, I think, is ideal if you want to sit down and listen to a piece of music. And then when it gets to the end, you could switch it off and you can make a statement in 20 minutes. Or you can then make another statement that actually um, complements, or in some cases, is like the antithesis of what went before. Now that ability to tell a story within a mu confined musical space is an incredible thing and the public really bought into it. If I pull an LP out here, obviously we get here the artwork, we get an artifact. If you think about, you know, the size of a book, you know, you buy like a paperback book, but this is a big thing. And so it introduced art into a household, you know, that's big enough to be perceived. I could, I could put it up in the background on the wall. You know, um, we have the rear cover, we have the details. This is a, a, a double album, and inside we get, we get a story. You know, albums tell a story. They're incredible things. I am sat in front of around about a thousand albums here, and um, this is my life. This is, what, this is what I have spent my time doing. You know, when I was a kid, I spent more money on my stereo and my records than I did on my drums or my guitars. The essential most important thing was my record collection. Um, I know I've been, I've, I've been told that, you know, people like Robert Plant, um, that generation that came up in the early 60s, they would literally go downtown holding a Bob Dylan album under their arm as a sort of badge of honour and a sort of secret code to spot who else was around that was into this special stuff. The album is an incredibly powerful thing. On this video, I'm going to be going through the albums that have really shaped um, 20th century music history. Now, of course, in the 1980s, the CD came out and the CD was able to hold a lot more records, sorry, a lot more songs on there, a lot more running time. And uh, this, I think, was a little bit of a killer for this idea of the album. Um, I can remember buying so many CDs in the 1980s that were about an hour and 10 minutes long and not being able to get through them, even though I love the artist. I don't think it was as good a medium for making a co coherent musical statement. And so there we see the, big, the end of the idea of the album. We all think they're albums. You know, records that was made in the 80s and 90s, specifically for CD, we think of them as albums, but are they truly albums in terms of having, you know, um, a big chunk, a chunk of music here and then a break and then another chunk? You know, this idea of it flowing all the way through for an over an hour, I don't think is um, as an attractive um, a, a method of um, getting your artistic musical statement out there. Of course, downloading comes in, and then um, now streaming, and we have now gone back to the way the music industry was when it first started, where we are dealing with just single 
tracks and people are trying to promote themselves through a single track and once you get single tracks that goes much more towards popular music because now people are now making a judgment about the artists in say two or three minutes rather than 40 minutes and the uh, industry will then start to push things which are much more commercial much more accessible much more digestible in a matter of seconds rather than in a matter of minutes and that makes a big diff difference um, a band like Led Zeppelin did not promote themselves through singles, they promoted themselves through the album. And that meant that someone would buy into Led Zeppelin. Um, the, there was a mystery to those records, and so you would give them the time. So when you arrived at the end of Side One on the Untitled album and Stairway to Heaven started, you were ready to give it the time. And in giving it the time, it turned Stairway to Heaven into one of the biggest songs in music history. You will not get a Stairway to Heaven. You will not get a track that has that sort of cultural grasp now that we have downloads and streaming. Okay, so a lot of people who moan about the state of the current music industry, I think this never gets said that it's the death of the album that's caused the move towards a, a much um, greater sort of commerciality in uh, contemporary music. Right, so I am now going to run through um, what I think are the 10 most important albums in music history. I'm going to start at number 10. So at number 10, I have Paid in Full by Eric B. and Rakim. And I never thought on this channel I would be talking about this album. Um, rap emerges in the late 70s. There's some incredible records at the beginning of rap, some really serious um, stuff going on. But very quickly, the music industry gets hold of rap and it sort of turns into something that's quite frivolous and comic. And, uh, and the great early hip hop bands like Run DMC, great as they are, it, it, it's quite frivolous. Um, in the mid-1980s, hip-hop, as it's now called, or rap as we called it uh, back then, became serious. And we saw the, um, uh, the uh, bands like Public Enemy, um, N.W.A., um, Ice-T, came out with a serious message, with a dangerous message. The um, uh, producers started to pull in from all this stuff they started to go back to the heavy music the jazz and they would sample from that so that so the musical um, background was more sophisticated the rapping the subject matter was more sophisticated and this ushers in what is known as the golden age of rap the golden age of hip-hop um, by the early 90s, we have some incredible rap groups or rap artists, Michelle Endegacelo, Brand Nubian, um, Diggable Planets, um, a whole host of stuff. And that starts to influence mainstream rock music, mainstream jazz. So um, what we see in the, uh, begin in the middle of the 80s, a certain artist that assert rap as an art form. Is it an art form now? Has it now degraded? I don't know. There's uh, people like Kendrick Lamar out there that I absolutely love. I think they're great. But on the whole, rap seems to have, have, have dropped down to that sort of, as Winter Masalis calls it, the minstrel show. Um, and a lot of rap seems like that to me, although there's some incredible technical rappers out there, without a doubt. Um, Eric B and Rakim paid in full that came out in, um, I think it's 1986, I haven't put the date down here, I think it's 1986, can really be seen as the beginning of the golden age of rap, the golden age of hip hop. And um, in terms of the production, we saw um, a move towards much more sophisticated sampling, um, really looking back at the history of um, black music forms, soul, R&B, and moving into jazz, music into fusion. And we also see a, a heaviness emerge in the lyrical matter and I think this is the album and I'm no expert on rap but I thought um, as rap has become like such an overarching form right it could have easily stayed as a novelty act in the early 80s and I'm sure there's people watching this channel that which it had um, but it didn't and the reason is is because I think we could place it that with this album paid in full by Eric B and Rakim and that really consolidated the idea as rap as an art form. And believe me, if you listen to a jazz group or a fusion group now and you listen to the rhythms and the way they're playing and the, and the loopiness of it, hip-hop has influenced jazz fusion back so much 
Um, and in some certain cases, if we look at the way all music is made in terms of its, the digital creation on a door, the door, the, the development of Pro Tools, Cubase, Logic, the development of the door is, in, is linked directly to how hip hop was created. So um, that's what I've got at number 10 is uh, Paid in Full by Eric B and Rakim. Right, at number nine, I have the Velvet Underground with Nico from 1967. 67 is like a watershed year in terms of rock music, right? We see Sgt. Pepper coming out, we see the beginnings of prog rock with Pink Floyd, we see the beginnings of jazz rock fusion, psychedelic music, you know, Cream come out and sort of develop heavy metal. But as we all know, as rock music progresses, it's going to go on a journey. And by the end of the 70s, we've moved into this idea of punk and indie music. All the sorts of bands that I absolutely hated when I was a teenager at college. You know, everyone was listening to The Cure or The Smiths or The Sisters of Mercy. And they had a certain look and they had a certain approach to music making which was much more based upon, we could say, a sort of postmodern ironic take on rock music. Now I've criticised this approach on this channel quite a lot, um, but it is undeniable that what we call indie music, which is a, is a form of music, that indie originally meant independent artists, and so now we've got mainstream artists that sell millions and millions that, that pommel that sound, okay? Now, when I was at college, I used to go around to my friend's house who was a big Cabaret Voltaire and the Swans and he loved, loved all these, you know, weird 80s indie bands. And on his wall, he had a poster of the Velvet Underground. And I used to look at this and I couldn't understand why they looked like everybody at my college, all these indie fans. And I thought, that's a band from the 1960s. How come they look so modern? In that respect, in terms of stance, musical approach, in terms of referencing, Velvet Underground were a groundbreaking band. Now, of course, when these albums came out, they hardly sold anything. The Velvet Underground was seen as a sort of, almost like um, a weird art band created by Andy Warhol. But of course, they were more than that. And in Lou Reed, they had a very, very competent songwriter that before the Velvet Underground had worked almost in that tin pan alley. This is a guy that could write proper songs in the same way as say a Carole King or um, a Joni Mitchell. A very, very great songwriter. If you listen to something like Perfect Day and you listen to the structure of that song, this is not a punk song, it's not an indie song. It functions almost like a Burt Bacharach song, but the subject matter is much darker. Um, in terms of John Cale, we had a, 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 a classical trained musician, highly experimental, absolutely very knowledgeable that could improvise on his instrument. So this wasn't the run of the mill punk band where they couldn't play. That's not what the Velvet Underground was about. But Maureen Tucker, the great drummer of Velvet Underground, she basically made her drum kit and couldn't play it. And uh, that approach, that indie approach, if you put all these things together, the statement is made by the Velvet Underground is really laying the foundation for a certain huge area of music. And of course, Nico, with those sort of blonde, you know, model looks, is also the blueprint for, you know, Blondie and then later on Madonna. There is so much on this album that is so important at the time. And, and I think the idea of this sort of postmodernist um, approach to rock music um, against the sort of Nietzschean lavishness of a Led Zeppelin, you know, um, that starts here with the Velvet Underground. So that's what I've got at number nine, right? Now, at number eight, I have got, and originally I had a Love Supreme here, which is uh, why a Love Supreme is on the thumbnail of this video. Um, and the reason I put a Love Supreme on was because um, I thought this is the beginning of the, the idea of spirituality on an album. And this is influenced by bands like Santana and the Mavish and Orchestra. And that moves towards the sort of, um, the sort of spiritual um, e you know, smell that we get with new age music. Um, but 
I think a lot of that was because I absolutely love a, a love Supreme and I didn't want to put this one on again. But the reason it's on is because it is so damn influential. And it is, of course, kind of blue by Miles Davis. Um, this was made in um, 1959, right? So we're right back in the 1950s with the idea the album um, really grabs hold. And what Miles Davis is doing with Kind of Blue is he is creating a, what you could see as a concept album. This is an album that explores the blues, but it explores the blues in a certain way. It's not so much looking at 145 chord progressions, although there are a couple of tracks that explore that. This is much more looking at modality, right? So um, this album is very important in terms of de delivering an album which has a concept. Now, lots of jazz artists were doing this at the time. Um, you, you could buy a Dave Brubeck album where he played like uh, music from the sort of southern states, for example. Um, what's that album called? I can't remember. You'll tell me in the comments. So this was happening at the time. You know, they, the, Mars wasn't the first to do this, but it was so successful that it, it, it really ushers in the idea of a jazz artist with a conceptual framework to their albums. Um, but the introdu introduction of modality, the introduction of creating music in the studio which is very, very important, with, with much less compositional structures, not going in prepared. You know, when Miles Davis made um, Kind of Blue, now this is, um, is really coming from Licentia Pour the Scaffold, which is a soundtrack album that, that Miles made in France. He went to, over to France and he got asked to do a soundtrack album. They pulled in some you know, French musicians and he went in and just looked at the, the, the film and, has, and improvised down. And I think this was a groundbreaking, he, he, even for Miles, I think this is where he discovers a different pr approach to making albums. Of course, most albums are made like this now. Most people don't go in with a song that's all written and all the parts are written out. People create the music within the studio. So when 10 years later, you've got things like Sergeant Pepper coming out. We could see that Miles Davis has, has, has pushed a certain approach creatively. Now, um, that's all well and good, but let's go into two examples, specific examples where Kind of Blue is so important. The first one would be on funk. Yeah, funk. Um, before funk, we had soul, and soul was a different thing. Soul was like uh, rhythm and blues mixed with sort of uh, church music, gospel music. Um, Jays Brown in 1967 goes into the studio, right, and his band are jamming on So What, the opening track of Kind of Blue, right, which is a pretty modal track. It's, uh, it's just it's two modes moving back and forth, and they're jamming on the first one. So that idea of modality, uh, the idea of having a fixed um, a harmonic centre and there's no cadences, the cadences have been provided rhythmically or in the lines. Um, this allowed the um, James Brown band to get very riffy and they're jabbing on it and when James Brown walks in they're, they're sort of going and they've sort of morphed it into that point and at that point James Brown recognises it picks up the mic and we have Cold Sweat. Now Cold Sweat is one of the most important um, single records in music history, but it's not an album. This is an album and we can see how Kind of Blue um, influenced the development of funk, okay? Um, at the, you know, the turn of the 1960s, there was a, a composer called um, Steve Reich and he was interested in moving um, sort of what we could call contemporary music or what everyone calls classical music forward. And he was exploring ideas that would move that forward. There'd been um, people like Lamonte Young who had um, really brought the conceptually, the, the material of composition right down. Now, um, when Steve Reich heard this album and My Favourite Things by John Coltrane, he was very interested in the lack of harmonic movement, the modal aspect, and it inspired him to develop the ideas that go on into minimalism. So here we have Kind of Blue influencing um, two very, very mus important music forms, but of course, it also changed the trajectory of jazz completely and became the biggest selling uh, jazz album uh, in music history, if you don't count Kenny G. And if you want to know whether we should count Kenny G or not, I have a whole video on that. 
but I can uh, assure you that no Kenny G albums are on this list. Shall we move on to number seven? This is an incredibly groundbreaking album. It is Ch Trans European Express by Kraftwerk that comes out in 1977. Kraftwerk actually came out of um, the whole sort of kraut rock movement of the early 70s. You know, that sort of doomy, improvised, dark um, antithesis to prog rock. Um, the, the, the style of music that I never talk about on this channel, Faust and Can and Amon Dull and all these bands that I never mention. And the reason is because I was never a big fan of these dark and doomy bands. Um, their influence on music cannot be overstated. Kraftwerk start off like that. Um, and this again is we see in the 1970s is these postmodernist ideas. Um, whereas rock and roll could be really seen as a sort of assertion of the self. It's the, it's the, the idea of the Superman. It's, it's uh, Jim Morrison or Robert Plant standing like golden gods. You know, uh, it's about self-expression. But in the 1970s, um, influenced by postmodernist philosophers and, and people like Roland Barthes, the idea of, of, of the sort of death of the author, right? Um, that, that, that music and art forms, and I don't agree with any of this, by the way, but it's very interesting and an important influence on art at that time. The idea that art is not the, um, the voice of a, an individual. It's, it's just the sort of rehash of cultural stuff. And uh, Kraftwerk are really interesting because they start to move towards a sort of anti-hero. Um, anti if we see Robert Plant as the hero, if we see Jim Morrison the hero, Jimi Hendrix as the hero upstage, the charismatic frontman, which really comes from like Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra and all that, um, what the, they start to do is they start to become like a, a, um, a mass-produced band, a band that's been created in a factory. They use, start to use electronics more, they start to use drum machines and programming and they themselves try to make themselves look at all as similar. They take out any artifacts in, in terms of performance. This in the 1970s is absolutely groundbreaking. Um, they, they had done this before with the album Autobahn and Autobahn is a very important album but it's patchy. With a Trans-European Express, we have an absolute masterpiece of an album. And that opening track, which is called, um, oh, something Europe, is it? I can't remember. But if you listen to that opening track on Trans-European Express, I'm annoyed that I can't remember that. What's the name of that? The title um, describes sitting on a train traveling across Europe. There's no angst there. There's no big statements. It's just the feeling of being in a man-made machine moving across Europe and seeing the things go by. It makes no greater statement than that. Um, when you listen to that record, you can hear the sort of disco. You can hear the arpeggiated keyboards. It's a quite a long track that develops and it really does paint the picture of almost being hypnotized looking out of the window and seeing a pretty landscape. There is no more of a statement than that. And in that, it's an absolute genius track. Of course, this is going to influence virtually all music afterwards. Giorgio Moroder is gonna, uh, you know, hear that track and he's going to then, you know, mix a little bit of that with some Parliament Funk and Denning before you know, you've got Donna Summer, you've got disco. Disco turns into house music and house music could not exist if um, Kraftwerk had not pioneered the idea that you can dance to machines, okay? So house music then, you know, begets techno and it begets drum and bass and jungle and trip hop and uh, it begets everything that exists in the music industry that us musos who like to have real bands in real rooms playing, this is the beginning of the death of that. 1977, 1977, can you believe it? Um, this is nearly 50 years, you know, 47 years ago, Kraftwerk made an album that when you put it on, sounds like an album that could have come out yesterday. This is an absolute masterpiece. And the thing I love about this album, I put it on again the other day and had listened to it. It's a beautiful album. It's that they, they, they got it right. It's, it, it could be so hard not to get that right and just have a really boring album of arpeggiations and loads of just drum machines. But they they have um, they 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 understand the hook. 
They're obviously not great singers, but they understand the hook and that the hook is more than just the melody. It, it's, it's a single chance of an idea, right? And that's what I hear with Kraftwerk. They are really, really one of the most important bands of the 20th century. And that's what we've got at number seven. And as I say this, I think this could well need to be higher up on the list. I think the reason it's lower down is because the influence of Kraftwerk is on everything I hate. <laughs> Now I say this as someone who in 20 years ago was making dance records, I was producing stuff, programming drum machines, programming house beats and I do love all that really but I think my interest here in terms of prog and jazz and fusion has, has dropped that down a little bit. Um, of course I would not be here if it wasn't for heavy metal. Heavy metal was the music form that really you know, my ears pricked up. I was like, whoa, what's this? And then I went towards music. I listened to music when I was a kid, but heavy metal made music really, really important for me. The new wave of British heavy metal in 1980. That's the watershed year for me. Now, of course, heavy metal is another huge uh, music form. Bands like Iron Maiden have sold like 200 million records. It's an incredible music form. Um, if you're a teenager and you want to show your sort of um, rebellion against society and you're, you're probably white and middle class then you're going to love heavy metal aren't you and that's a staple. It's still there now. I have students turn up and I know all their mates are listening to Taylor Swift and these kids walk in with their long hair and their you know Metallica or Nirvana t-shirt on it still exists now. I'm, I'm trying to tell you how heavy metal is an important genre and we can really um, take heavy metal back to a specific album can't we and it is of course Black Sabbath's debut album in 1969 where Tony Iommi and the lads got everything right. They got the riffs, they got the darkness, they got the lyrical matter, they got the album cover, they, they, they pulled into this idea of you know the, the horror movie, Satanism, of evil, of darkness, all that's there. It's not there with Led Zeppelin, I mean communication breakdown, there we have you know beginnings of heavy metal there, uh, Deep Purple in Rock, you know uh, Speed King, we have the beginnings of heavy metal there, that's, that's all there. But Black Sabbath, they create something else, they get they, they create the smell of heavy metal, you know. Only somebody from Birmingham would be able to create the smell of a style of music, you know. And um, I say that as a sort of um, a, a Midlandite, you know, here in the UK. So, you know, I love those Birmingham bands. I do. I've grown up with them. They're part of my culture. And Black Sabbath is a part of my cultural heritage. And I absolutely love that band. Um, they got it right and they got it right on the album. How they did, I don't know. Absolute geniuses. And the thing with Black Sabbath is, is that the sound that they get is actually like, or unlike all heavy metal that comes after it. They have a very specific sound, which for me is darker and more menacing and, than any heavy metal that comes in. And Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and all these bands, they, they never had the sort of turgid brilliance of Black Sabbath. So that's what I've got at number six. At number five, I have an album from 1966. Remember when I said 1967 was the watershed year? You know, if you go back to 1965, we've just got pop groups. That's all we've got. We've got pop groups, and then we've got some jazz artists doing stuff in the background. You know, rock music has not happened in 1965. By 1967, we've got Jimi Hendrix and Cream. We're going to get Sgt. Pepper and all that. What album can we go back to 1966 that really makes the statement before Velvet Underground, before the Beatles, before Cream, before Led Zeppelin? What's the album that's really making that rock statement before anybody else does? This is something nobody else will say, but I'm about to say it now. It is, of course, Freak Out by Frank Zappa. This album is just so important to the history of music. Of course, it didn't sell like a Sgt. Pepper, so in mainstream culture, it is not seen as being this incredibly important album. But what Frank Zappa does in 1966 is completely rewrite the book in terms of music. And musicians heard this album and this changed them. It changed the Beatles, it changed the Beach Boys, it changed everybody. Freak Out is a double album that does so many things. I, I, to list the new things it brings in is, is very difficult. It really 
Um, it really argues for counterculture back in 1966. Now, you've got to remember, Frank Zappa was making this album back in 1965, all right? Um, on this album, he is pulling together a, a really weird mix of music styles. He's got like the he's got doo wop in there. He's got the blues, blues guitar specifically in there. He's got classical music, modern classical music, Veres and people like that. You know, Weber. He's got all that in there. He's got um, jazz, but it's like avant garde jazz. It's free jazz. He he's put in there the idea of the studio as a creation tool. Now, Frank Zappa it was unlike any musician of that era had ended up living in a recording studio. So he had learned how to use a studio. Uh, musicians like Paul McCartney and Bob Dylan and John Lennon and Jack Bruce and all these musicians at that time, they didn't know how to use a studio. That was the, the domain of people in white suits with pens lined up in their pockets. Zappa understands the studio and he has a vision he gets signed, it's a fluke he gets signed. The record label think they're signing a blues band because then when they went to see him at the gig, they were playing some blues and the blues was becoming very important. They didn't get that. He got the budget to be able to bring in like orchestral elements, hire musicians. Freak Out is, like a, is, is so important and pioneers so much stuff that it's very difficult here to get into it. So what is it, what is it pioneer? The idea of synthesis, the idea of using the studio to change sounds, the idea of criticising the powers that be, uh, being a thorn in the side, be, being critical of, of the way things are. It uh, brings in the idea of a concept that runs over a double album. It's got a, a long form composition at the end of this album. Um, it uses like music concrete. It's, it, it, um, it, <laughs> It has improvisation on there. It has the electric guitar up front. You know, there's all these things that no one else had really done. And so that is why it's so high up. Now, of course, um, its influence on, say, the Beatles is, is self-evident. In 1967, the year later, we have Sgt. Pepper. But to give the Beatles their due, for me, because I was originally going to put Sgt. Pepper on the list, and I thought, no, for me, the experimentation comes in with Revolver. That's where they really make a grand statement, and that is 19, I believe it's 1966. So Freak Out and Revolver, you put those two albums together, right? And to me, they're sort of related. Revolver is, is like the, the, the mountain peak of popular music. The Beatles are the biggest band in the world, and they've moved to this point where they are still writing pop music, but the pop music is now very, very sophisticated, and it's, it's, it's able to spin out or influence much heavier, more esoteric artists. They, they're, they're now listening to the Beatles. You know, a lot of jazz musicians are listening to the Beatles. People like Gary Burton are listening to the Beatles. John McLaughlin is listening to the Beatles. So um, we have that, and then with Freak Out, we have this underside, all emerging in 1966. I would say that these two albums are very, very important in terms of, you know, pushing musical culture to chime with what's actually happening in the wider culture at that point. Um, and uh, so I have a number four revolver by the Beatles. That's the album I've got. So we're now back down to the, uh, the top three. Right, so at number three, this is a very, very important album, but in a way, it's an album in the true form. I didn't want to, on this video, you know, include albums by Louis Armstrong or Charlie Parker, because they never made albums. They made single records, and then later the music industry pulled those tracks together into an album, and that was the original meaning of the album. It was like a photo album. It was a collection of singles, you know, like you had an album of singles. This idea is the conceptualization of the album is... Um, is a thing that develops in the 1950s. But this album is a collection of much older songs. At number three, I have King of the Delta Blues Singers from 1961 by Robert Johnson. Now, why do I include that? Well, I'll tell you why, because it doesn't quite fit the, um, the bill. But of course, this was an album. It was a specific album that came out in the early 60s and had a huge effect on music. And of course, Robert Johnson, 
made that album in two recording sessions. You know, he turned up in some hotel where they set up some recording stuff and he put a whole ton of songs down and then he came a few weeks later and put some songs down and then he disappeared back into obscurity, uh, dying in 1937. Um, so, um, this package of Robert Johnson is actually pulling a whole bunch of songs that were recorded in the way that we make albums much later on in one session. It's not a collection of all different songs from different places. Um, I'm pretty sure that Robert Johnson would have gone in and done a performance. It's like two live gigs that have been captured. Um, this album, when it comes out in the early 60s, was the album to own, 1961, okay? Musicians, especially in the UK, because there's a history in the UK of uh, music that goes back to trad jazz. There's no real jazz in the UK in the 1930s and 40s. There's sort of cocktail bands and they've just got it's so far removed from jazz. The jazz um, movement that emerges in the, in the mid 40s is the trad jazz music uh, movement. And British musicians are then looking back to um, traditional jazz, New Orleans jazz, and they're also going back to people like Lead Belly. And through that we have the, a superstar pop star emerged, Lonnie Donegan, who is exploring that idea of that sort of um, um, country blues, you know, the Delta blues of people like Charlie Patton and Lead Belly and Brian Lemon Jefferson. And there's an interest in there in the 1950s and these artists have start, start to uh, come over. And um, the emergence of this album in the UK in London in the early 60s inspires a whole bunch of musicians, you know. So someone like Eric Clapton or Robert Plant, this was the album. Robert Johnson became the superstar. And the thing is, with Robert Johnson, he is like the ultimate rock star because we know nothing about him. And so we can put onto him all sorts of myths and ideas. The idea that he'd sold his soul to the devil. You know, we don't know anything about him really at all. You know, uh, historians now have researched and researched and we pulled together an idea. But back in 1961, nobody really knew anything about this guy. So this guy just sort of emerges out of the ether and then disappears. And um, Robert Johnson um, is like a... A miracle worker, the guitar playing's incredible, his singing's incredible, that falsetto, and he's, um, he's at exactly the right point in music history to be pulling from the whole history of sort of American songwriting that goes back to Scottish folk songs, Irish folk songs, European folk songs, and it all pulls together. And so we see the emergence of like Fairport Convention, we see the emergence of, of um, uh, you know, like Led Zeppelin cream and all that stuff. Stuff is all coming out of Robert Johnson. But over in the states, we have people like Mike Bloomfield. It's happening there as well. This album is really the beginnings of rock music. Believe it or not, and it's such a strange thing, but rock music can really see as a source of coming from this album from 1961, King of the Delta Blues Singers. Right, this created an interest in the blues, but also American folk forms, and the idea of songwriting, the idea of a, a, a someone with acoustic guitar singing a song, and the message of that song, and people would listen to it and be moved by this. Now, at number two, I have Free Wheeling by Bob Dylan from 1963. He, this is his second album. Bob Dylan is one of those people that has been become very interested in you know um, country blues early blues folk music he's listening to Lead Belly all that type of stuff he's listening to Woody Guthrie when Woody Guthrie comes out of Lead Belly as well Lead, Lead Belly is so important to the history of music and anyway so Bob Dylan here we have him exploring all that but he is a sort of you know white middle class uh, artist can a white middle class singer sing these songs do it still make sense on the first album he does but on this album freewheeling he stops playing the cover songs and he starts to write his own songs he starts to take the spirit of the message that, which we hear in lead belly and, and and woody guthrie which i've always said is a mixture of the sacred and the profane. It's this idea that you, we can sing about anything and there's a, there's a spiritual element in talking about being down and out or talking about, you know, sexual matters. This is, this is, this is the gift of the blues 
to songwriting and Dylan recognises that and he re recognises the importance of the, the message, the, the lyrics. He, he re realises the prettiness of his voice is not important and that in singing in the way he does, he can um, draw attention to the lyrics where if you have someone like Ella Fitzgerald singing it, you are just swept away by the beauty of her voice. This here, this idea of the singer-songwriter that begins here in 1961 uh, so, sorry, 1963 with freewheeling is the thing that changes rock and roll into rock music, right? Um, musicians that hear this from Miles Davis to the Beatles to Frank Zappa, what they hear is a de democratization of music. They hear that you can bring other elements in, you know, you can do whatever you want. You know, this, this album goes into some incredible places, really does. 1963 for me this album has always been the beginning of the i hate to use the word rock music because i mean i'm in, i'm including everything reggae funk disco the whole lot that change over the beginning of this cultural form that i took to discuss on this channel starts actually with um freewheeling by bob dylan in in uh, 1963 um, this really should be top of the uh, charts, but I have one album that I've put at the top. And the reason is, is because I think the idea of the album starts with this album. At number one, I have In the Wee Small Hours by Frank Sinatra from 1955. A huge selling album, an album with a concept, an album that had been made to work within the bounds of the album. Two sides, 20 minutes long, with all the songs sort of referring to a central concept. And then this album sold millions and millions, right? Frank Sinatra is a key musician in 20th century music. Um, before the invention of the microphone in 1925, um, musicians, uh, singers like Al Jolson, if they were performing live, or Caruso, they would have to walk into that big hall and fill it with their voice. Right, so this brought out the super talented singers with the singers that had projection and power, right? And that idea still is there in terms of um, when we discuss great singers. But the invention of the microphone, singers like um, Louis Armstrong and Billie Holiday um, understood the fact that you could get up close and on a, on a recording create this intimate sound. This, in, it, this influences um, Bing Crosby, and Bing Crosby becomes one of the biggest pop artists in music history. He's one of the biggest selling artists. I think White Christmas is the biggest selling record of all time. And in uh, <coughs> exploring the idea of being up close to the microphone, Bing Crosby actually invents multi-tracking and a whole bunch of things. Um, and then there's this idea that we take from Bing Crosby and it transfers into Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra just one of those singers that was a, a singer that a, a big band would have. He was with the Dorsey Brothers and he was up front singing. When he, he almost like kills big band jazz because um, Sinatra has the look, he has the charisma. And so we can really see, I'm not gonna say Frank Sinatra is the first pop star. I actually believe that Gene Krupa, the drummer with Benny Goodman was the first pop star. Um, but Frank Sinatra becomes a phenomenon in the 1940s, okay? Um, and he's making singles. When the 1950s comes in, he starts making albums, and these albums are huge sellers. Uh, the biggest and the best of them is In the Wee Small Hours, which um, explores the, the night. It, it, it explores the same idea of kind of blue. I mean, it's, no one's ever said this, but the kind of blue which comes out, you know, four years later, was that a record company saying to Miles Davis, you know, look at Frank Sinatra, he's just done this song about, you know, sort of the, the night and the darkness and all this, and uh, could you do something with a similar sound? I just don't know. But I think if we wanted to point at the, the, the moment in time when the album becomes the greatest um, cultural artifact in music in the 20th century, I would point it in the wee small hours by Frank Sinatra. And if it isn't, it still um, forms as a nice closer to my list, doesn't it? Um, and so hopefully on this list, 
which is more of me getting to discuss and celebrate the idea of the album. Right? That's what this has been really about more than anything else. Um, on this list, I hope it's illuminated what is an incredible thing. Let's just pull one out and have a look at it. What have I got here? <laughs> oh, what I've got here, this is um, from 19... This is a 1970s compilation of singles that has been put together by a record label called Surprise Chuck Berry. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I got this, God, 40, 50 years ago, and I got interested in Chuck Berry, and I wanted all the tra best of tracks on, you know, one album. Now, this is a best of, really. Sweet Little Rock and Roller, Reading the Rocking, Back to Memphis, Back in the USA, Oh Baby Doll. It hasn't got the really big famous ones, but it's like a collection of, of ones that they could probably get um, some sort of licensing on. The next thing I need to do is the Ted Greatest Best Ofs, isn't it? Now, as soon as I say that, I think of the, the, the Queen Greatest Hits album, uh, which I think is one of the biggest selling albums here in the UK. But that would be an interesting list. That's another thing altogether. And I wish I hadn't pulled that out. I wish I'd, I'd pulled something out a little bit more like that. That's what I meant to pull out was that. There we go. The beautiful album, the concept, the spinny wheel. The spin I mean, look. How can you do this with a download or stream? You can't do that with a download or stream. Look at it, it's psychedelic. You know, imagine you bought this album in 1970 and you've rolled your spliff, and you're listening to this psychedelic, trippy, folky, heavy metal rock album and you get the little thing and you turn it around like that and you get taken off into an alternate reality. You can't do that with a download, can you, or a stream? Come to the end of the video. Thanks for watching. If you do like it, like it. Put a like down in it. Like the video, please. Come on. Press a like now. That's all you got to do. It won't hurt you. Nothing will happen to you. You're just going to go click, press the like. And then I'll get loads of likes on this. And YouTube will go, ooh, that's good. Let's stick a bit more traffic his way and my channel will do much better. And if you want to hear more, you could subscribe, which means that you will get, all you're going to get is in, when you switch on YouTube, it will have the next video that I've made, hopefully, and you can then watch that and you might go, oh, that's interesting, I like that video. So if you like this, you want to hear more, because this is what I do, right? If you like what I'm doing, this is what I do. So if you like it, subscribe. If you are a fan of what I'm doing, and I am very grateful for you, you can support me by becoming a Patreon, Please check out my Patreon. There's all sorts of stuff on there. It's not just extra content. There's all sorts of things where you can get involved, right? And if you don't want to become a patron, you can put a donation into my um, tip jar. At the moment, I want to upgrade this cruddy camera that I do this on. It's become a staple. The look of my videos is the, this, this cheap video camera, which I just happen to have got in the in, in in lockdown and thought well I'll film some videos that's how it started and I want to upgrade my camera so um I'm thinking of getting there's um uh, a zoom do a, a, a q2n something or other it's about 200 quid 250 dollars I want to buy one of those and I'm going to do it out of the older um, uh, tip jar so if you want to you know help me upgrade the channel and go to a higher quality this is what I need you know, um, get better audio on it. The Zoom's got, but I don't want to be fiddling around with microphones. I've got microphones that you have to do. Anyway, I'm telling you all the back ends, the workings, you know, of um, my YouTube channel, which is very postmodern, isn't it? I am very meta and I'm very postmodern. And if you like the meta and postmodern and you want more meta postmodern, then go to YouTube, tip jar and stick some money in there. I'm done. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you on the next video and uh, over and out.